it records the actual video. It looks would really you, good. Recorded. Would you like to try something else? In terms of what? Have we tried like XSplit or OBS Studio? We can try it. I mean, we can try streaming uh, some Tuesday from, and then I don't got, I don't have to buy the second equipment. I would love to show you like streaming through OBS. I can bring my desktop here. Which has it all and set up ready to go. Well, we've got the OBS on the. Um, oh, on the Mac. On the Mac. I forgot about it. yeah. I, could set that I mean, up. if you want to come, I don't. I don't want to ask you to do it twice, but this week. But if you want to come and like try it out, or if we can, I, I'll. I'll just set it up and I'll play with it. Like, but yeah, then I can record with the Miva and I don't have to spend another. Yeah, let's do it on like hours. a like a weekend when you've got off and you want to play or something. Right. Like, I don't want to like do it on like. You know, you know, we gotta go. <laughs> right. And then something happens, and it's like, crap! It's nine o'clock, and you haven't you haven't recorded crap, and I'm trying to right. get something to pump out. All right, here we go. Take two. Does uh, let me check before we go. Uh, the Facebook group does it? Sound? All right. See, that's the difference between an iPhone and an Android. Galt. I was trying on a Samsung to send it out, as opposed to the normal iPad or iPhone that I use. So, just going to be honest, the Samsung just wasted 20 minutes of my time. So, not not only did Galt call me and and ruin the first take. Yeah, ruined it. It was on the uh it was on the Samsung that I tried uh, on, so. What one of my favorite people on Twitch just went live. Okay, well, you're going to ha have to focus on this. This is what we're doing here. It's Mega Server, Mega Twitch. I, I really don't care about Mega Douche or whatever. Mega <laughs> All right. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what? I can't, to be fair, it's a Samsung Galaxy J7, which is maybe have a quad-core processor, but it only has two gigs of RAM. So it has Apple-level RAM, right, with Android, like, crappy overhead. So just to be fair, just on Android side. But no, no, they they ruined this. All right, here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am blowing everything out of the water. Damn, damn, son, a little too hot. Take three. <laughs> yeah, podcasts are always better the third time you've done them. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber at Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com, which is the hub for all things wall. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. In exchange for your supporting of the program, we're going to give you awesome bonus content. Sometimes that's an extra hour a week of, of us talking about issues and other things. Uh, this show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag wall news, W-A-L news, or in our Facebook group or Discord channel, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Please be warned, this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive because we talk like ourselves. In this show, we will bring you the headlines, and then we will cover net neutrality. We're going to talk maybe a little abortion, but first, I want to introduce my co-host for this episode. It is the uh, dashing Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good, going good. Um, here on the back end, you know, he's using this, like, this, this iPhone right here, and he's going to use this dongle so he can hook it up to the board, you know. So. Right. I got a dongle. Mm -hmm. I have several dongles. <laughs> so I'm, I'm awaiting the day when we have a lot of people donating on Patreon. The, the, we've got tens of thousands of dollars to spend on a professional studio so I don't have to spend an hour and a half screaming at my equipment. Yeah. Have you ever spent the night screaming at your equipment, Harry? Yes, I have. Yes, <laughs> I have. And, and sometimes it's a lot of fun, but uh, sometimes it's not. And especially when you try to get something going and actually moving. It's like, right, why won't you just work? <laughs> now, and I, then it does the job. <laughs> I wanna, before we jump into the news of the week and start talking through all the stories that you need to know, I want to take a moment, a uh, point of personal privilege. As uh, all of you listening know, this has been a difficult week or two or three for the We Are Libertarians family. And uh, I have received so many nice emails from people. I'm not going to read those emails, uh, but I just want to say that if you 
If you reached out to me on Twitter, on email, on Facebook message, and uh, just sent me a note of encouragement and thanks, I, I really do appreciate that. And uh, you personally, uh, I'm speaking to you this side, Harry, you have no idea how much that meant to me and how much easier you guys have made this on me. And uh, I want to thank you for, from the bottom of my heart for uh, just being the community that I love. You guys, you guys are so great, and I know that you guys are reaching out to everybody else. And uh, Harry, one thing is clear, everybody loves you. Yay. Just a shocker. <laughs> there, there's just like a whole segment of the audience that I didn't realize till you started the Discord chat, and uh, I don't understand these people. I don't have anything in common with them, but you do, and uh, you, you, you're, you're going to... That's why I just said to you before the show, I was like, you know, you should do more on Tuesdays than... than just like picking stories and talking and all that because, like, they really li they really like you. Yay! Well, yeah, we are the Discord people. Like, I was shocked as that with all the people jumping in Discord, or even the shocked of the people that really. It's, uh, very like almost like it's almost it's kind of a little scary. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, because you. Because now you're like, I realize that the things that I say here mean something to people and they listen to it and you will go, I better do extra due diligence to make sure I'm not dumb. Yeah, I'm not dumb or I'm not saying anything out of turn or make sure like everything is well researched. And even when, and I also like it that them and the, the guys on Discord chat are very, you know, they have no problem about messaging me like, yeah, Harry, two episodes ago, what you said was wrong. And I right. appreciate that. I love that, you know, especially when they send me an article. Here's another here's another article to rebuttal what you just said. Sure. And that's what the cool thing about the Discord chat. It's more it's more of a chat room than a Facebook group, so it's not really like a post and have discussions underneath and like. It's a, you know, back to the old days of, an, of a, basically a chat room. It's a little bit, it's prettier than an um, IRC chat or AIM chat, you know, you know, for LP people who are still using AOL Instant Messenger. Um, <laughs> It's you know it and it's nice because we like we get on there we post memes it is out beneath it's out from underneath right now currently um, from the Zuck thumb so anything basically goes that we allow and myself I, I kind of allow anything as long as it doesn't get you know people with shiny shoes kicking down my door I'm not gonna ban anyone from there I'm not gonna kick anyone from there and like like I said unless you send people with shiny shoes to my door. You know, so it's, you know, it's kind of raw there. It can get that way. But most of the time, like, I am shocked at some of the discussions that happen there. It really is the urchins of the wall world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, they, check, I check in once a day just to kind of read through it, but I try not to hang out there just because I feel like it's like when the teacher goes to the party or if your parents hang out, at, like, behind the row behind you at the movies. Yeah, so. yeah. They summon you down, though, sometimes. Oh, they do. Yeah, they yes. Do. They, were, they had a lot of questions over the last week yeah. and a half, and I yeah. just... Trying to be uh, as gentle and graceful as possible. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, yeah, which is really cool because it's like, like I said, it's a more of a chat room. It's more of a discussion and allows us to flow and have communication with. And also, like myself, like when I do, like we Twitch stream on Friday nights, the Friday like Discord game, which sometimes not everyone gets on to play a game, but we all can't agree on a game. You know, we just go in our little separate rooms to play games. Um, I do Twitch stream it. Uh, so like if you're if you're not a gamer you don't you just want to jump on a Twitch and have a conversation with me or just talk about different stuff I'm fine with that too I let open the uh, voice channel that I'm also on on the Discord chat just because some people like myself I hate ch chatting and typing it's a lot a of this lot stuff of typing I'd yeah. rather just have a I'd rather just have a conversation so one of the cool things that's happening is that you guys are, are uh, since we started the Patreon and, and started asking people to subscribe and giving them bonus content and creating another group and another Discord channel uh, we're, it, it, and then you know our recent uh, uh, troubles like yeah. we, we have really been uh, deeply engaging with a lot of the audience and we want you to join the conversation so please uh, we want to we want to see the, the stories that you care about. That hashtag is WAL News. Use that on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, get in the Facebook group and uh, post articles that you think are interesting. You're going to hear a lot of stories tonight as we start to uh, try and, and do more news and talk through the news a little bit more and, mm -hmm. uh, and just give you more because that's what you guys have said you wanted. So, and, the, and the other benefit to hashtagging, other people can search those hashtags. You can converse with other libertarians. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't believe that we are the end-all, be-all of libertarian thought. We are just trying to present ideas, and we want you to engage 
with us and say, hey, Harry walked in and goes, you were horrible last week. You were awful. You were so wrong about so many things. I was like, well, hey, you're wrong, but <laughs> let me hear why you're wrong. And he explained his ideas, and I, uh, I listened to him, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. he was wrong. And so... But it, it was it's about having a conversation, and I think what we're trying to do here at We Are Libertarians is have a conversation about current events and libertarian principles and uh, try to do something different than you're getting anywhere else. Like, I watched an hour of CNN tonight. <laughs> Wolf Blitzer is the worst piece of garbage on the planet. They were talking about Jeff Flake and Bob Corker, which we'll explain in a moment. And it just was a rep, a Republican rep after Republican senator after Republican rep coming on into Wolf Blitzer going, do you renounce Donald Trump? I mean, for an hour of just, do you renounce Donald Trump? I mean, I just didn't learn anything that was going on in the world. Uh, it was just very uh, lame. So independent media like us really needs your support, and uh, that part of that is communicating with us and telling us what you want to hear and what you're interested in and conversing with other like-minded people as you will get in the Discord or the Facebook group, or using the hashtag WAL News. All right, so let's get on to the news of the week. First up, our first story is Senator Rand Paul and Ron Wyden are unveiling a long-awaited privacy protective surveillance bill, and uh, you can search that headline at Reason. Reason wrote about this. As did a few people, but Reason covered it the best. And Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, if you've mm-hmm. heard of FISA courts, establishes some of the rules for federal intelligence agencies, Harry, when they snoop on the communications of foreign targets and uh, foreign targets on foreign soil. Correct. Now, they've abused it as the government, yeah, as the government does want to do. And they are spying on American citizens. I'm shocked. I know. And the FBI has conducted backdoor searches to fight domestic crimes. And it happens without a warrant and without mm-hmm. citizens knowing. Ooh. And it's a wide-sweeping thing. It expires this year. Mm-hmm. And so now they have to let it sunset completely, which I would be in favor of, uh, or lawmakers must renew it now. Now, Senator Richard Burr, B-U-R-R, drafted a bill which... Um, was debated today okay. behind closed doors, and uh, it not only renews 702's current set of federal powers for the next eight years, it expands them, and it formalizes some of the activities that people like you and I would disagree with. Hmm. So uh, Burr's bill would, this is from Reason, formally authorize the FBI to use information from communications collected without a warrant and, ho- and for a list of wholly domestic crimes. These include various offenses, including kidnapping, crimes against minors, pretty much anything related to cybersecurity, organized crime, sex trafficking, and anything related to national security. Furthermore, if the Attorney General determines that a crime qualifies as part of this list, the bill declares that this decision will not be subject to judicial review. communications collections, and these have typically typically been described as allowing surveillance of communications uh, to a foreign subject, but in fact the feds were also collecting communications about a foreign subject. So they can, let's say, Harry is actually French and he's suspected of terrorism, they can go on and they can just type in Harry Price and start collecting information about the Harry Prices of the world. So, so convenient. Yeah, so in, it, it just c- continues to shred the Fourth Amendment. And so Ron Paul and uh, Ron Wyden uh, and Rand Paul, two of the best senators on privacy, have drafted a bill that would uh, do the opposite of what Burr wants. It would roll back the NSA and FBI's ability to secretly, warrantless, warrantlessly collect, access, and use communications from American citizens or, or from people on American soil. And the bill, if you want to look it up, is Uniting and Strengthening America by Reforming and Improving the Government's High-Tech Surveillance Act of 2017, the USA Rights Act. Um, It would restrain their ability to acquire or access American uh, information, and it it has some exemptions, and so it does allow for surveillance of foreign domestic terrorists, but it is much stronger in protecting American citizens. Ron Wyden is somebody that has been absolutely fantastic on government spying, Mm -hmm. as has Rand Paul. So uh, be sure to look out for this bill because I think it's something that's uh, not going to be talked about in the mainstream media because Donald Trump tweeted 
but something that is incredibly important to our Fourth Amendment rights. Oh yeah, it, it's a, um, it's that whole like a, when everyone got up in their arms around what Snowden and the other whistleblowers were talking about in um, 2008, 2009, about like them taking that that uh, they speak of that drag of prism and all that to against the you know like U.S. citizens. It's and they were collecting and they were, and even also the whole through this case, you go through it, they can't even the Congress can't even find it out one. one how many like American citizens have they actually hit with this thing? They, because it's classified information, and it, a lot of people like to address it as if it's all like, well, they could use it. They never haven't been done, but there's been clear cases inside the United States of them using some sort of program or something like that to basically backtrace and find different things. Now, granted, some life maybe has been saved from using this program. Sure, but you know it's a huge violation of rights. It's just, and it even goes back to Ross Ulbricht that case. We still, we still do not know how they found the server, mm. how they find it, where do they backtrace this traffic, how do they get there. Did we know that they had people inside of Root Access? Yeah, but we still don't know how they found it. Right. Uh, Snowden was a great movie. Watch that. Check that out. Uh, we have the movie poster on our wall, and I think that will scare the crap out of you, yeah. and you will start looking into the USA Rights Act. Mm -hmm. um, don't let the fact that it was by Oliver Stone scare you. It's actually really great. Uh, our next story, the FBI failed to access 7,000 encrypted mobile devices. Uh, now, the government, Harry, is very upset right now. <laughs> they are pissed off yeah. at encryption. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, this is from BBC News. Agents at the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation have been unable to extract data from nearly 7,000 mobile devices they have tried to access. The agency's director has said, Christopher Wray, said encryption on devices was a huge, huge problem for SB FBI investigations. The agency had failed to access more than half of the devices it targeted in an 11 month period. One cybersecurity expert said such encry encryption was now a fact of life. Many smartphones encrypt their content when locked, a standard, a security feature that often prevents even the phone manufacturers from accessing data, including the beautiful, wonderful iPhone. Yes. Uh, so, Harry, you've got to be thrilled that your data is secure. Yeah. Well, um, do I think they could probably crack the uh, passcode on here? Yeah, because I've memorized it and, you know. But, you know, the Apple does it really well because Apple d uh, does it by default. Android just now starting to encrypt things by, by, def by default, but even then you can easily opt out, out of uh, on Android because people, because it slows Android phones down when you encrypt it. Right. Apple for some uh, Apple is a little more streamlined with it and a little more superior, right? Well, it's because they control. No, 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 no. The, it's okay. You can admit it. Yes, they're they superior. They control the hardware right. and the software, so it's a little bit more optimized. We'll say optimized, <laughs> right? Which means superior. <laughs> okay. So optimized. So it just it's all very fun. And the idea, I almost think it like I don't really kind of trust it. I think they try to say like seven thousand phones that they can't easily decrypt. Right. Because to me, it's like. Yeah, I don't know because usually if you've got a subject and you've got one person that you know that it's like a, all right if I ha if I would have had to break someone's encryption on someone's phone and get the passcode off it I like to see how many other passwords of this person I can collect because people leave passwords everywhere like uh, most people like on their phone like they'll let Chrome or Firefox save their passcodes right. You know, a lot of that's in plain text. You get some of those passcodes off of there, and you can basically look at the way this person creates passcodes. Uh, Chris, you, usually, you, you let LastPass create your passcodes, so a lot of random characters, but sure. a lot of people don't. A lot of people just like, well, I just make up words. Or if someone can look at it long enough, like, wait a minute, this is a book. Someone's right. using a book to create these passcodes with. Which, you know, Get me wrong. Hey, I used to use phrases too and to create passcodes. I'm going on a tangent on passcodes. Yeah, you got you got 30 more seconds, Harry. <laughs> Give him a timer. But like you could use that to crack the passcode, and you know, that's not beyond the capability of the FBI uh, to basically go through someone's history to get break these freaking passcodes. So yeah, I mean, if you remember, we we dodged. I really trust it. Yeah, we dodged a bullet, and maybe they're laying the groundwork for uh, for uh, undoing this because during the San Bernardino bombing situation. Mm -hmm. He had an iPhone, and Apple refused to uh, let them into the phone, and they said, we can't even break into it. Like, yeah. And we're not, there's like three people in the world. We're not going to compromise their safety mm -hmm. by uh, figuring out how to break our own encryption, Correct. because then they become a target. We're not, then every government in the world starts to want to do it, and that defeats the point of the encryption. So we're, we're not going to do it. So yeah. 
Uh, so hopefully this is not laying that groundwork. Yeah, and with every like uh, government backdoor, if a government can get it in, in for a backdoor, uh, any person, any cracker out there can do it as well. Right. And if, if you're thinking like, well, they won't let secrets out. Hey, this is the same government agency that leaves you know laptops everywhere with nuke codes and stuff. Too right. It, so. All right, on to politics. It has been, uh, frankly, it's been, I don't want to say a historic day, but definitely. Donald Trump continues to uh, push the political system to the limits of what it can stand, and part of me loves that, but he's also a total degenerate, and uh, I hate his guts, and I... Degenerates are awesome people, okay? You're right, you're right. He's an insult to degenerates everywhere. Uh, And you had, uh, it started off, we'll talk about Bob Corker in a moment, but the bigger story, I think, is, I don't know, they're pretty equal. Uh, Senator Jeff Flake was somebody that was coming in in 20, 2010, I think, mm-hmm. and was somebody that I think the YAL, Young Americans for Liberty, worked with him. He was supposed to be one of the new Rand Pauls, Ron Pauls uh, of the world. And uh, frankly, Jeff Flake from Arizona has been a disappointing senator in, in a lot of different ways and didn't turn out to be the great non-interventionist small government hope that a lot of us libertarians would like. But he's still a fairly conservative senator. The Club for Growth rates him uh, very well. Um, and, and ironically, he has voted politically, as has Bob Corker, with Trump 100% of the time in terms of in, in agreement on policy. Uh, Jeff Flake, though, has been a constant critic of Donald Trump and was somebody who wrote a book in 2016 about American values and how Donald Trump betrayed those. And so he's been on Trump's S list ever since. And, uh, and and Bob Corker, I think, is the more interesting story, uh, which we'll get to. But uh, Jeff Flake decided not to run for re-election and decided to finish out his term, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, now, not incredible if you look at the polling. Okay, he was, according to his own polling, uh, he was trailing in public polling to former state senator Kelly Ward, an arch conservative endorsed by Bannon. Steve Bannon, who mainstream Republicans considered unelectable in a general election. Um, Kristen Sinema, a progressive uh, turned moderate, serving her fourth term in Congress, is the likely Democrat. Um, Take this for what it's worth. Uh, John McCain said, I knew that he was thinking about it. Very sorry it happened. He's one of the most honorable men I've known. And uh, Chuck Schumer says he's one of the finest human beings I've met in politics. He's moral, upright, and strong, and he will be missed by just about everybody in the Senate. Now, uh, he doesn't seem to be a bad guy to me. In in watching him, he just seems to be uh, in disagreement with a lot of the things that we believe. Um, A top Republican strategist told Politico that they'd been polling since the beginning of the year and had repeatedly found no path to victory in either the GOP primary or the general election. Uh, a month ago, his team delivered the news to the senator, and uh, he's been re- considering retirement ever since. And he's basically lost to everybody. There wasn't a Republican or a Democrat that he could that he could uh, beat in a primary or the general. Um, his problem was the center of the electorate, which usually supports McCain. They just the independents didn't know Flake, or they disliked him because they just heard bad stuff about him. So. Um, he, he said in his speech, as he said goodbye, it was actually, it was a pretty stunning way to go out. Most people do it in a statement, or they hold a press conference, or they do it back in their home district, or their home state. Bob Corker did it from, or, uh, Jeff Flake did it from the Senate floor. Mm -hmm. And so he stood up there and he said, uh, the following, we must never adjust the court to the coarseness of our dialogue. Now, there are a lot of people, hey, let me, before, let me preface this. Yes, he is now growing a pair of balls because he's retiring, as is Corker. But Flake has been a consistent... He's having to retire because he went up against Donald Trump and lost. Uh, and Trump, for, for his petty credit, was beside himself with joy, according to reports tonight. Uh, yeah. That's not a joke. That's, people said he was beside himself with joy. <laughs> he's just he's something else his second self <laughs> um, we must never adjust to the coarseness of our dialogue with the tone set up at the top we must never accept the deadly sundering of our country the personal attacks threats against principles and freedom and institutions and flagrant disregard for decency reckless outrageous and undignified behavior has become excused as telling it like it is when actually it's just reckless outrageous and undignified 
And when such behavior emanates from the top of our government, it is something else. It is dangerous to a democracy. The decision came to flake. Uh, so then he goes on to say, um, I'm aware that there's a segment of my party that believes that anything short of complete and unquestioning loyalty to a president who belongs to my party is unacceptable and suspect. The notion that one should stay silent as the norms and values that keep America strong are undermined and as alliances and agreements that ensure the stability of the entire world are routinely threatened by the level of thought that goes into 140 characters, the notion that we should say or do nothing in the face of such mercurial behavior is ahistoric and profoundly misguided. Um, so I found his speech, I, I think it's uh, worth watching, mm -hmm. it's worth 17 minutes of your life to go and listen to what he had to say. Uh, because I think it's like McCain's speech, uh, even though these guys are people that we disagree with. And here's the thing about Trump. Uh, I, I think Trump is blamed oftentimes as the cause of a lot of this behavior, but I don't know about you, Harry, but to me, Trump just seems to be the symptom of the underlying problem. Like, he is most people. Yeah. Most people are Trump. And mm -hmm. so it's it's not Trump. It's that we're people are outraged that we've become this. Yeah. They're seeing this like a mirror of themselves. They see it inside there, and they're like, "Well, he's doing this to American politics." It's like he, the American politics is already like this. Of course, they even had a little bit more decorum, more more etiquette, and use better words. But it's the same thing. It's the same thing that has happened. Right. It, it, even in the founding times, we were falling into disarray. But like you watch, you watch. Uh, there was the uh, some Idaho senator on Wolf Blitzer tonight, and he was one of the people just being pounded. Mm -hmm. by Wolf Blitzer, you know, do you agree with Senator Flake and Corker? Like, uh, are you for or against Donald Trump? Do you buy, believe blah, 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 blah? And, like, the guy was just evading the question, and you really get the sense that, like, what Flake is saying is what a lot of these guys believe. It's just they're too much of a coward to say it. And, like, that's really the problem in, in politics is that it's inauthentic, it's, it's dishonest, they're cowards, yeah. they don't say what they actually think, and... You may not like Donald Trump, but you know where he, I mean, you know where he stands at that particular moment. It just, it's going to change in mm -hmm. like five minutes. Yeah. But like, that's the appeal is that he is a, a change from that, that kind of senator. Um, and for all of his flaws, John McCain's one of those people who's disliked because he just says, eh, here's what I believe. Yeah, over it. Yeah, yeah no. Right. Back uh, in his and, cage. But yeah, but most because most senators or most congressmen who say what they believe, you know, they have a safe district, right? You know, like Ron Paul, say what you want about him, but he had a safe district. Yeah, you know, he can get up there, say what he wants, and he probably would have did it whether he had a safe district or not. But he had a safe district. Yeah, just like Rand, he's um, he was a little scared there for a second for his reelection, but once he's got it, you know, he's feels more safe, but he's made such a name for himself. He's he's okay. He can go against Trump. He can work with other people because he he's now safe. Yep. And it's, you know, just how some of these, like, um, you know, congressmen are. Like, until they get safe, they get scared. Yep. And so, like long, a, long story short, don't be a pussy if you're an elected yeah. official. Or in general. Yeah, like Joe Don, like, he's, you know, he's he's a little, uh, you know, he's a little scared, but... Uh, he's getting, you know... Yeah, and Joe Donnelly's the Indiana Democrat, which means he's like a Republican in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, he's like a far-right Republican in New Jersey, but... Right. Yeah, and he messes up on the main stage because he doesn't get well with the main stage Democrats because right. the main stage Democrats does not work here in Indiana, in the flyover states. Yeah. So he's got to like kind of like work his whole life, which, you know, like well, that's the state that he's in. I'm not going to make excuses for him. That's, that's his party, that's his excuses, but, you know... So. Yeah, so if that was the only, like, Republican speaking out about Trump, I mean, of course it is um, significant when somebody uh, gives a speech that was as eloquent as Flake gave on the Senate floor as they exit the, the stage, basically saying, like, I've got kids and grandkids. And, and I think really what a lot of it comes down to for so many people is, uh, would you allow your 8-year-old to talk the way that Donald Trump Talks. Would you allow your eight-year-old to be as petty and as awful as Donald Trump is? Would you, when he talks and, and does these sorts of things, can you explain it to your eight-year-old kid? And that's kind of like the litmus test that is being applied in the media. Um, Grown-up life is much harder and much more complex than we allow eight-year-olds to see it. Yeah. But there is something to be said that um, if you're going to, like, as, as we've talked about over the last few episodes, Harry, I mean, a moral code mm -hmm. and having 
personal principles yeah. are the underlying uh, fabric of libertarianism and freedom. Like, if you and I don't treat each other with personal respect, mm -hmm. then that fabric gets torn. And I think the values that Donald Trump exhibits so often are are antithetical to the way that two individuals can can relate, and therefore antithetical to libertarianism. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Because he just has to have. Now, granted, Donald Trump speaks like an eight year old sometimes. You know. But it's, right, <laughs> and it's kind of hard to describe anything to an eight-year-old with going there and talk to because a lot of them are lawyers and stuff like that, and they right. don't speak like lawyers. So sure. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole thing of the print that that principle mindset, so they actually have something back to fall back on instead of like all the other junk. So they're not listening to a lot of the you know what you quote unquote money lobbyists. Right. That's why like you can find yourself can agree with, and, and someone who's like. That does fall back in principle. That's why. That's why so many people in the libertarian movement clench onto Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. That's that main, that main reason of that, like that cult of personality, because of his principles. Yeah. Even like um, um, my person, like who I, you know, I like during the um, um, LP campaign, campaign, the um, establishment anarchist Daryl W. Perry. I liked his principles. He's mm -hmm. a hard worker for liberty. You know, so that you know that those principle moments right there. That's what you like. That's what people fall back on. Yeah. Especially uh, in their darkest hours when they're behind closed doors. You know, they fall back on their principles. So Bob Corker is somebody that I think is an interesting person and uh, kind of like his style, to be honest. He's from Tennessee. He's the senator uh, from Tennessee. He is the head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, which means he's one of the most powerful people in not only the government but the entire world because he controls some of the purse strings of the uh, Foreign Service Department and, and is involved in a lot of foreign uh, decisions. Um, and obviously, as as we, in my opinion, have an empire, you have a lot of uh, decisions to be made abroad, and uh, he's a very influential person, which means he's also a very powerful person in his home state. I don't know what the polling was like, and if he would have won, like Flake was going to lose, but Corker didn't seem to me to be one of those people who was in trouble, um, but he just didn't want to go through the hassle of running for election again and uh, continue to serve with Donald Trump. And he um, had an interesting day. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to like, agree with you, B.R., because he just you know, disagreed with all that. He hated the, like, the whole you know, parade of it all. I think we got an insight today in an interview with uh, CNN that he did that uh, you can check it out at CNN's website that I thought was really interesting. Just hear, hearing his two press conferences that he gave today uncut, I think are a fascinating insight into how Washington is really working right now and uh, Corker was one of Trump's early advisors and was somebody that was being looked at as uh, Secretary of State. And, uh, you know, he, he ended up not being chosen as Secretary of State, and he has been critical of Trump now. They had a spat, uh, and they had another round today that was a doozy. Um, if he, he basically went on the morning shows, like Good Morning America and NBC, and he said on NBC, if you start taking things off the table before you get started, you make that very difficult. Essentially, Trump was going to Capitol Hill today to have a luncheon with the very Senate Republicans and I think some of the House Republicans as well uh, to smooth over some things so they can get ready to really pass this tax uh, reform package. They've got to do something or Trump's re-election their re-election next year when they have a chance to pick up many, many Senate seats mm -hmm. is going to be in jeopardy now that they've failed at Obamacare. They've failed at uh, some big items that we've detailed in the past. Rally the troops today. And uh, he was basically saying, you know, if Trump starts taking things off the table, he makes it very difficult, so he hopes that uh, the president will leave this effort, if you will, to the tax writing committees and let them do their work and not begin taking things off the table that ought to be debated in the committees. Mm -hmm. Essentially saying that tax law should be written by tax committees in the House and the Senate where tax law is supposed to be written and not at the White House. Uh, and <laughs> then he was, <laughs> he was asked on NBC, and this is... This would make me mad, too, so I'm going to give Donald Trump the benefit of the doubt on this one. Uh, if Harry asked, do you think Chris Spangle's a national security threat? Mm -hmm. And then Corker said, uh, well, he needs to be contained by Jeremiah and James <laughs> Neese, and maybe he is. <laughs> that would make me mad, too. Yeah. Uh, but Corker was asked if he was a national security threat, and he said to NBC that he needs to be contained by members of his cabinet, like James Mattis, 
Rex Tillerson, and John Kelly. Yeah. Let's let's put that into perspective. All right. So we get into the petty dramas of politics, but let's put this into perspective. You have a Republican head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee mm -hmm. saying that the Republican President of the United States is a threat to national security. <coughs> And that somebody needs to take care of this adult baby in the White House. Yes. I think that's an extraordinary thing. Yes. Now, I think it's extraordinary when uh, a senator calls the president a giant baby. Let's see how Trump reacted to it. Uh -huh. Bob Corker, who helped President O give us the bad Iran deal and couldn't get elected dog catcher in Tennessee, is now fighting tax cuts. Corker dropped out of the race in Tennessee when I refused to endorse him and now is only negative on anything Trump. Look at his record. Well, the record is he was one of your main advisors. Yeah. He probably was going to get reelected. Mm -hmm. He is not against the tax cuts. Uh, you and your White House are the ones saying he's against the tax cuts to make him look. Like somebody posted in our Facebook group, you know, this Bob Corker was against tax cuts and is a neocon. This Trump guy sounds pretty good. I'm like, eh, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bob Corker has never said he's against the tax packages. Mm -hmm. All he's saying is that he thinks the Congress should do it. And he uh, dropped out of the race because he didn't want to deal with your bull S. And uh, not because you refused to endorse him. He flat out says you're lying. And trust me, I'm going to believe Bob Corker over Donald Trump when it comes to the truth. I don't even know Bob Corker. Like, I've never really heard of the guy until 2016. Yeah. But I know Donald Trump's a fat liar. Um, so, uh, he did have a lot to do with the Iran deal. So, that is a fair charge by Donald Trump. Uh, Corker replied, same untruths from an utterly untruthful president. Alert the daycare staff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's, Corker just gives it right back to him, which is part of why I've started to like him. He's uh, pretty entertaining. Yeah, so, but he's right, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Corker basically went on to say, like, this is just, um... Un untenable like this is uh, I, I just you need to go watch the flake speech and I think you need to go watch the and we'll put them in the show notes you need to watch uh, his his Corker's uh, reviews today because I think they're saying what everybody in Washington is saying what a lot of people in America are saying and people are afraid to say it because that's what bullies do bullies don't let you speak out against them and all of these Republicans are scared to death right now, thinking what Bob Corker and Jeff Flake are saying, but they're afraid to do it because they don't want to get bullied like Jeff Flake and Bob Corker. Now, they're grown-ass men who are senators, so bullying is, like, not the right term. Like, they're not defenseless, you know what I mean? But it, it is very interesting to watch what happened to Jeff Flake when he took on the president for the last year and a half. Yeah, they're politically intimidated. They're, they're, he's trying political intimidation. That's trying. exactly right. You know, because one, one person has to do an election next year and the other person doesn't. So. Exactly <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> on to a heartbreaking story in politics. Harry Price, Kid Rock, gave an exclusive interview today to Howard Stern on Sirius XM and said he is not running for Senate. Mm. And I quote, Are you effing kidding me? F no, I'm not running for Senate. Who couldn't figure that out? I'm releasing a new album. I'm going on tour, too. Are you f effing shitting me? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he basically said, we started going with it. Everybody got their panties in a bunch, uh, he said to the chatter. I have people that work for me, and they're in on it. And I'm like, F no, we're not doing that. But let's roll with it for a little while. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said it's a, he was asked, Stern asked him if it was a strange position to get political if he's a musician. He said, it's the worst advice that I ever gave myself was to be political because it, it's been the most creative thing I've ever done and I've gotten to see everybody's true colors. So it's interesting, you know, once you start getting real out there, then uh, you start seeing how people react to you and how they truly are, if they're your friends or not. If you're Kid Rock, I mean, yeah. he's a walking cash register, I imagine, to most people in his life. Yeah, I'm sure he probably, like, didn't want to do it then thought of really thought about it, and then he looked at all the um, FC, yeah, not FCC, <laughs> right. FEC filing, all the stuff you have to do through all the regulations for running for Senate, and he was like, "Oh, screw that, yeah, screw that noise." Yeah, exactly. And he said, uh, "If they keep effing with me in the papers and everything, I'm going to run, and I'm going to f, and I'm going to go to effing DC. I'm going to beat the s out of Debbie, whatever the f her name is, 
and I'm going to go to DC and I'm going to smack the living S out of all those MFers on the hill. He said, <laughs> he said the actual words, I'm just trying to clean up the show a little bit. Uh, Richie, uh, his real name, uh, his real name's like Rich Richie or something. It's not Kid Rock. Uh, believe it or not, that's not his given name. Uh, he basically thanked everybody who supported him, including the White House, I guess, was on board, and so was Steve Bannon, who gave him a call. Oh, and, uh, you know, the moment the talk of a run began, everyone goes, he's a Klan wizard, he's a homophobic, he's Islamophobic. And I'm like, this is kind of fun, Richie said with a chuckle. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, he, he was just having a good time. I got my hopes up because I was actually going to support Kid Rock. Not James Weeks. Uh, not James Weeks, who danced naked on the stage, uh, right. who was going to be the who would be the uh, alleged libertarian candidate up of Michigan. Mm-hmm. I'd have to go Kid Rock. That's that's horrible. Um, he's an American badass. Okay. If I can't dance, I don't want no part of that wicked revolution. Okay. So that's what... <laughs> all right. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> all right. This is a headline. Harry. <clears throat> I'm going to have to uh, use a bit of our racism insurance, so please get ready to exercise my premium. Hopefully, hopefully Roy Moore. I'm just gonna open his PayPal account. Up. Hold on. <laughs> hopefully Roy Moore doesn't uh, hit the deductible here. But uh, this is a headline in the Hill, Harry. Okay. Roy Moore, mm-hmm. gay marriage ruling even worse than 1857 pro-slavery decision. <laughs> Now, you'll remember Roy Moore beat uh, Luther Strange in that uh, runoff a few weeks ago that we told you about in Alabama. The Ayatollah of Alabama, as we said, would would really be like this year's uh, Todd Akin or Richard Mordock, where he's going to say all kinds of crazy shit or, th- or things, uh, or things are going to get dredged up, and then everybody's going to have to defend them. So let's deep dive down into... What year was this? Uh... Oh, let's see. Last November when he said this. So ancient history. Or ancient history. <laughs> Republican Senate nominee Roy Moore once argued the decision to legalize gay marriage was even worse than its ruling in the 19th century Dred Scott case, which found that African Americans were not citizens and therefore property. Uh, yes, sir. I was simply pointing out that in 1957, the United States Supreme Court did rule that black people were property, and of course that contradicted the Constitution, and it took a civil war to overturn it. So, ruling at Ogerberger is worse in a sense because it forces not only people to recognize marriage other than the institution ordained of God and recognized by every state in the union, it says that you must now do away with the definition of marriage and make it between two persons of the same gender we're leading on, as one of the dissenting justices said, to polygamy, to multi-partner marriages. This was produced by the Christian Emergency League, which described itself as a group of pastors and theologians, and it was uploaded by this liberal super PAC and talking to the left found it. So, Harry, uh, <clears throat> let me ask, uh, Harry, you are um, black. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, identify as black. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh do you think that allowing gay marriage in America was worse than you being property? Let's see. Well, 1857, that was that jobs program for all the unemployed black people. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's, it's wrong and insensitive. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> shout, out, shout out to all the people you enslaved, by the way. Would you like to uh, admit what you did in the past? Uh, first off, um, you know, my family, you know, didn't have slaves when they came to America. Because you were forced to give them all up by because, England and you yeah, moved to America <laughs> because it was still legal here, you racist. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, go back to my family history. That that's all out there, that's all true. They actually even like went to the like the French side to screw over England because they got rid of slaves. You know the black people that caught the other black people to make them slaves? That was Harry's family. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But, you know, that's okay. But, uh, yeah. <sighs> See, the, that's some of the... No, no, it's not okay. Um, what? You know, it's ancient history. Anyways, <laughs> water under the bridge. <laughs> that was a jobs program. Like I said, a jobs program. <laughs> you know, best thing ever happened to black people. Sorry, that's a bad joke from the Boondocks. Great episode, by the way, when you can listen about Kitcher Freeman. But, um... <laughs> what was... Is gay marriage worse than you being property? No. No, first off... Um, 
this guy's just like misinformed and he doesn't have any principles to fall back on. The thing when we talk about principles, he has no principles to fall back on. Right. He's basically going to have feelings and emotion and like these sandy uh, principles. And it's one thing like the air caps do have a good thing on is trademarking everything because if the church, if the Christian church just trademarked marriage, you know, right. they could define it whatever the heck they want. But, hep, didn't trademark it. That's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm waiting for the trademark marriage means right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to a uh, little bit of Clinton news. Um, the uh, so basically the investigation. You know the thing with these special prosecutors, it, it, it expands and it grows tentacles. And part of the problem with these is that they start going into places that uh, you don't want them to go if you're certain people. And uh, everybody was worried that it was becoming a witch hunt, but it is becoming a witch hunt. Um, Prepare for the documents, Harry. I have the documents right here. New York Daily News is reporting the special counsel's probe into Russian election meddling now includes the Democratic-leaning leaning Podesta group, according to a report. Robert Mueller is looking into the, head group, into the group headed by Tony Podesta, the brother of the Hillary Rodham Clinton campaign, Chairman John Podesta, over its dealings with the Ukrainian government-linked firm. They reported Monday that the prosecutor is now reportedly conducting a criminal in inquiry into Tony Podesta and his group for a failure to register as a foreign agent, which is compulsory when lobbying American lawmakers for another country. And uh, the uh, let's transition right into House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunez. Uh, this is on Axios. Uh, announced a joint inquiry between the House Intel Committee and the Oversight Committee in the Obama-era Russian uranium deal. What the joint investigation wants to know, per Nunez, whether there is not, uh, whether or not there was an FBI investigation, was there a DOJ investigation, and if so, why was Congress not informed of this matter? The Obama administration reportedly signed off on the Russian deal, despite the fact that the FBI had evidence that Russia used bribery to edge its way into the U.S. energy industry. The Clinton Foundation is implicated. So, if you read Clinton Cash, mm -hmm. or you went go back and listen to our Clinton Cash episode, you will hear us talk about these deals. Mm -hmm. Now, the House and the Mueller investigations are starting to uh, they're they're looking into some of these things, and the. Uh, the accusers are now <laughs> wishing we may, I wish we hadn't started this, because now they're coming after the Podestas and Clintons. Oh, she... Yeah. King, don't kill kings. Uh, Clinton will be fine. Yeah. She won't see a lick of jail. Yeah. Yeah, probably... L lick of jail was sort of a weird phrase to use there, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Hillary might like a lick of jail. Yeah. But yeah, that's the scary thing about like, the Russians, like, it's like they went so hard in one direction and watching it all just fall back in yeah. the other direction, it's like, oh, whoa. Right. And watching everyone start connecting dots and everything else is like, wow, this is, you know, it, you know, one, it's like, you know nothing's going to happen from it, but it's kind of nice to watch it come out and watch the mainstream media just ignore it. Right. And the only thing they want to talk about Russia is with what has to do anything with Trump. Yep. Anything with Trump, it's, they'll try to link Russia to him, but Clinton, the Clinton Foundation, no. Even when Hillary was doing, like, the cir circuit for a speaking book, they didn't bring up any of that crap. Yep. Never. Nothing. Never. Never. Uh, this from antiwar.com, one of the best sites on the internet. The U.S. to put nuclear bombers back on 24-hour alert. U.S. officials say they are not planning to nuke anybody in particular, but they are preparing to resume 24-hour ready alert for nuclear bombs the first time since 1991. Uh, STRATCOM or NORTHCOM commanders would have to make a specific order for such a move, but Air Force General uh, David Goldfein is said to be increasingly interested in getting the nuclear arsenal ready. Uh, they are implementing these measures because they're anticipating an order that might conceivably be made, be made very, very soon. Uh, that's, I, don't, I, I don't think there's anything we can do with that right now, but just something that I thought everybody should be aware of. Yeah. It seems a little weird. Yeah. It, it's a move that like, the military can make, and the simple fact that the Trump administration has given the military a little bit more control for the actual boots on the ground. They're not right. controlling so much from D.C., they're allowing the troops around the world to, if they see something, they think they should move, they can do it and then talk about it later. Exactly. So this is probably some general or something like that so saw this and said, you know, we need to re get this going. Yep. Um, U.S. airstrike kills 14 civilians in eastern Syria, according to antiwar.com. 
U.S. warplanes attacked the Qusar district in Syria, a government-held area in the nation's far east, killing at least 14 civilians and wounding 32 others. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights reported that 22 civilians had been killed in the attack. The U.S. had not commented on the incident yet, but spokesman Colonel Dillon promised to quote-unquote check the reports and he said there would be no reason for the U.S. to attack the city, as neither the U.S. nor its Kurdish allies are operating in the area. That, of course, is not exactly a denial, and it's unclear if we'll hear about it again soon. The attack is likely to be a serious problem with respect to U.S.-Russian activities within Syria, as Russia is backing the Syria, Syria in taking the uh, as Russia is backing Syria, the Syrian government, mm -hmm. taking the Dr. Azor province from ISIS, and doubtless won't look kindly on the U.S. attacking a Syrian city in the area. Uh, final news, not our final story here, uh, because we've got net neutrality to talk about, but I wanted to touch on this because um, I've seen it all over Facebook. Ugh. I know. But we've got to talk about it because I think people, you've seen the ugly crying face of the transgender woman that assaulted a child in a restroom, and uh, we need to talk about it because what you're seeing on Facebook is that a transgender woman attacked a child in a restroom, mm -hmm. and uh, this is why we need to keep transgender people, you know, their biological mm -hmm. form. They need, if they were born male, they need to go to the male, because now we finally have our first assault. The right got its red meat. They got the first assault on a child in a restroom, and this is proof, Harry. This is proof. That this is going to happen all over the country, all of the time, right? Yeah, it's proof if you read if you just read the headline and just hit the share button, right? You know, if you just hit the share button, went, went around and didn't really read the article, poke around because so many different sites took this and then just kind of sparse information. It was very hard to really get like the first article from it or get the meat from it. I actually had to cross, you know, lines and talk to some of the leftist status to really like find like the big meat about this article, right? And when you, what you find out, when you read the article, you deep dive inside of it, you find out this is a home's bathroom. It just happened in a, in a house bathroom. Yeah, a 10-year-old girl in the bathroom was attacked by uh, Casper resident Michelle Martinez, whose uh, legal name is still Miguel Martinez, uh, was convicted of two charges of sexual abuse of a child and faces up to 70 years in prison. Certainly not making light of that trauma. No. That is a terrible thing to happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. We're making fun of baby boomers on Facebook who don't read articles. Correct. Uh, according to the Casper Star Tribune, Martinez knew the victim and lured her, her into a bathroom to assault her. Mm -hmm. Nurses uh, confirmed it. Martinez denies that this was uh, true. Um, it wasn't a stranger lurking in a public bathroom. It was... Uh, as often is the case when children are molested, the victim knew her attacker, and the mm -hmm. restroom in question was in somebody's home. Uh, it doesn't fall into that main narrative. And secondly, there doesn't need to be another law, because the existing law on abusing a child is adequate to take care of it. If she gets the maximum penalty of 70 years, she's not going to be in a position to ever attack another child. So no law would have prevented this, mm -hmm. and the hysterics just are not needed. Right. And uh, and kind of gross in my opinion. Yeah, it's gross. Yeah, I, not excusing any of that. That was awful. And people dealing like pedestrian, they no, no, those both got to put them away. I, right. Yeah, you know, those type of people, like I think what they said, they just should not be walking around normal freaking mm -hmm. people. Okay, that's that's oh, just it's so enraging to even know like someone like that. And I what I hate is that people are adding that to the uh, to being trans, like, well, these well, trans people are mentally ill. It's like, well, there's, you know, it's that's the trans thing did not make, you know, turn that uh, turn her into a, a, a pedophile. That was right. something else. It's something different, broken inside that other person. Yeah, and you know, and going after, and then you got the same thing with these baby boomer conservatives are like, well, now try to blanket all these trans people for this one thing. But at the same time, they were trying to, uh, they got upset because they got blanketed being gun over from it. You know, so it's like this. Can someone please message Aaron Ewert and tell him to stop FaceTiming me because I'm trying to do the show? Oh my god, why do people like. Uh, hold on. <sighs> now he won't pick up? No, now he's not going to pick up. I'm pick trying up. to do the podcast. Stop calling me. I hung up on him. Ugh. So tired of having friends. Damn. Ugh. Outrageous, Harry. Awful.
Awful. Go ahead. That's okay. Back, get... back to child molestation. Yeah, back to... <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, yeah, topic I wish no one really wants to talk about. But I feel, feel like the problem, yeah. you need the truth behind the Facebook headline. Let's go on to yeah. our Discord choice of the week. We've uh, asked our Discord got to choose the story. Uh, so <laughs> this is not a drum roll of paper. So what are we talking about this week? Uh, apparently they. Uh, <sighs> Net neutrality, which is always going to be in the news up until the government really gets what it wants. Right. I, and much before we go into this, I like tearing down the FCC. I hate it. It's a terrible organization. Same here. Um, you will, uh, I'm not going to, I really don't want to defend it. They are awful. They were designed to basically help dispute out a limited resource, which sounded like an okay idea back in the time, but... To, if you go actually in this history, it has done nothing but hinder communications in this country, put us more at risk, and are some of the, the it is one of the worst government agencies. There's a reason why we don't have that many radio choices on FM and AM. It's it's why podcasting has blown up so much because they have kept their thumb on radio for so long. Once it once the internet came in and opened up and allowed everyone to have like their own voice and create their own thing. You know, it's you know, it was a very beautiful time. So let the me, FCC let, at one time got so many different requests to for people to start their own like radio station or just have a uh, or a broadcast station on their FCC airways that instead of dealing with the issue, they just threw them all away and told everyone to resubmit. Yeah. So here's uh, here's what the FCC right. does. Here's how it was started. It was. It started in the uh, in, in the early days of radio mm -hmm. to basically regulate. The concern was you have this limited amount of radio bandwidth on the AM and FM dial, and now that we've discovered radio frequencies, we as a government are going to want a jurisdiction over our lands radio, a to keep foreign actors from having radio, uh, you know, signals in our in our airwaves. But also uh, to make sure that everybody just doesn't build their own radio station and everybody crowds everybody out. And then there's fights between signals and uh, I don't know what they were thinking. Like, to me, it's freedom and it would have all gotten worked out. It's very, very expensive. Yeah. It's insanely expensive to run an AM radio station and, and, and yeah. less than an, F and an FM station. But you've got things like CB bands, Wi-Fi bands, radio bands at both AM and FM. You've got TV bands. You've got military bands. You've got EMS bands. So you've got all these different radio frequencies mm -hmm. that uh, they the FCC guides. Now, over time, they granted themselves the power to start monitoring the airwaves for indecency. And after the Janet Jackson kerfuffle you started to see them uh, become the free speech police. Yeah. And uh, look up Bubba the Love Sponge and the pig. He basically played audio of a pig being slaughtered, and local PETA and uh, animal activists got him fined for $750,000 for killing a pig on the air. He didn't actually do it. It was, it was, ra it was a tape. Uh, I worked for a show that... I don't know that they ever got fined, but we definitely had to stop playing a good portion of the catalog out of quote-unquote, community standards. My community loved what they did, but the nannies mm -hmm. of, of the world, uh, a guy that I went on to actually do um, fight pro the property tax uh, thing in 2007 with, uh, John, which I knew his name, but uh, he was the one who f f uh, petitioned the FCC to uh, get them fined and kicked off the air because they were too crude. And uh, Howard Stern obviously went to satellite radio in 2006 because it just became so untenable. And the standard was essentially, um, we don't know, like I asked one time in 2004, what, what are the standards? Because I got yelled at because I said scumbag on the air. And they came and they talked to me and they said, uh, you can't say scumbag on the air. I said, why can't I say scumbag? And they go, that means a condom. It's a bag of scum. Cum. I'm like, who knows that? Nobody knows that. You know, like, well, if we get fined, we could get fined for it. I'm like, yeah, but nobody knows what a scumbag other than, like, 
the word scumbag is. You know what I mean? Like the eighty year old with the phone. <laughs> exactly. Get them. And so it was just up to the jurisdiction and the guesses. Like you literally just you just did nothing out of fear. It was the same yeah. as like these Republicans are bullied by Trump, so they just do nothing because right. the government bullied them. Now. Then uh, Obama came in, and Michael Powell came in, uh, the uh, Colin Powell's son, later in Bush, and then the Obama administration. The FCC really started to wind a lot of that back, uh, and now they just kind of regulate. Let me let me explain this to you, okay? I, I work at a cluster with four radio signals, and uh, each FM tower has one tower. The AM tower has three towers, and that's because it has to broadcast at three different wattages through the day because of the FCC. Yeah. Uh, and it, it it's just insane. The amount of money that it takes to keep an AM running especially is, is crazy. But the FCC just really doesn't have much to do anymore, so they're trying to find their own way. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, yeah, because AM signal changes at night. People exactly. who listen to AM radio, right. you could hear radio stations from like what is it like uh, my, miles it opens up at night. AM bandwidth. That's why like the, a lot of people talk about like listening driving or listening to AM radio stations right. because at night when you're driving, you can hear radio stations from or AMs from like all kinds of different towns you've never even heard. Of. We used to get uh, we wouldn't power up, and so Abdul and I would be on the air in the morning, and we would get uh, emails from Norway. What? Because the the wow. AM signal, even at like a thousand watts or whatever mm -hmm. tiny little signal it was, yeah. it would bounce on the curvature of the Earth just the right way to land in Norway. That's amazing. Yeah, and so yeah. so it and so every morning we had a guy from Norway that listened because he could pick it up fourteen thirty on his on, in his AM radio That's because crazy. he was just in the right position on the Earth to hear Abdul and I talk about Indianapolis politics. So so yeah, you have different frequencies. But the FCC uh, was basically um, granted, <laughs> they were putting this really weird, in, t in 2015, um, the, the Obama administration essentially made the internet, you can go back and listen to our podcast back in 2015 where we kind of break this down, where they basically, uh, the net neutrality is in the title, they made uh, the internet a public utility, and the yeah, FCC... Right, yeah gets to kind of govern it. Um, but there's some stuff happening with net neutrality because it, it's all based on executive orders. It's not based on any kind of legislation. It's not law. Yeah, because that's a federal re regulate, regulatory agency. Right, not, so yeah. we're now going to play ping pong with this every time we get a different president. So what's happening with net neutrality, Harry? Uh, right now, like, until like this, until the government really get well, each, agent, each administration gets what they want, it keeps going to keep coming back out there. And it's this weird fight with you've got because the Electronic Freedom Foundation and other people they really don't know what they want and what they're trying to fight is that tier throttling uh, situation from net neutrality that they believe that uh, because ISPs want to have the ability to um, throttle things or tier different things who don't pay them money and the only reason we're in this type of situation because the FCC limits the number of ISPs and watch that and they, they try to like they try to say quote unquote they're, they're there to help with um, you know like make sure there's competition but there's not you know there's and they a lot of misnomers a lot of people will, like talk about things like because they all right so let me slow down <laughs> yeah, the, yes please <laughs> sorry I just FCC just gets me so angry <laughs> so mad at them because they I love radio okay and then I, just, I love radio. It's not, I'm not a radio expert. I am a radio noob, but I love it. It's a lot of fun, especially with some of the weird things you can do. Anyways, um, from this article, like, uh, why is the media smearing the new FCC chair? Uh, where did this one come from again? Oh, Forbes. Uh, Forbes, yeah. yeah okay, there's yeah, a, so there's a writer, and let me say, a, if you want to know what's going on with a lot of this, there is a writer at Forbes, and, man, I wish I had kept his... Um, name in this, but... Yeah, you can print this off I, weird. I, I printed it off weird, but if you go, uh, Google a legislative solution may... a legislative solution for net neutrality may be close. It's the same writer, mm -hmm. and he is following this really closely, and this guy at Forbes just really understands the, uh, this, this stuff really well, and if you want to follow what's going on with net neutrality and the FCC... This writer at Forbes is amazing, so I'll, I'll put I'll put links to all this in the show notes at wearelibertarians.com, and you can 
you can get all the articles that Harry and I read and prep for this. Yeah. Right, yeah, because basically, like, what's going on is the, the, a lot of people on the left are going after the new chairman, which is Pyle, who, who Trump put in place. And they're trying to say that he wants to put back in a lot of the old, uh, take out a lot of the old regulation that Obama did. But which, and they, they're just kind of like just dragging his name through the mud, using different things that he's been on the committee different for. But in re all reality, like, Pi just sees it as the, as the case because he wants to be able to bring broadband access and internet access to like, the last mile. Get, basically allow the internet to flourish like it did back in 08 before the, a lot of different rules of the, of the Obama administration did it. And the only way that really did it is because the ISPs believed that they could charge different people different rates to uh, get into this tiered system. And a lot of people were hating this tier throttling system, but the thing is, they get ticked off because they want to do this internet, but you know they're allowing other companies to do that to them. They allow Verizon to throttle them. They allow AT&T to throttle them. They allow Comcast to throttle them right now. Comcast throttles streamers all the freaking time. You can get on Twitch, and you can watch streamers like they start lagging out of nowhere because they're getting throttled. get a bit more expensive business line. The, uh, and a lot of people are like, whoa, you know, they're going to make some sites slow, some sites like, yeah, but a lot of people who say that type of thing, right, you, you don't understand, like, the massive bandwidth that the internet does have with what you have. Anyways, you're already throttled down to whatever package you want to buy from your ISP. So if you're throttled down to 100, you know, 100 megs down, 100 megs up, yes, you're being throttled because you don't have a gig connection. You're being throttled. Uh, just like the simple fact that the, uh, what is the other thing, like the, uh, but most people don't leave Facebook. Most people just do Facebook, Netflix, okay? And they kept talking about, like, well, they don't follow the internet. Well, you know, Netflix is probably going to play a premium to their ISPs to make sure you can get that HD streaming content. And it has been proven that they've done this in the past. Like, a lot of people had to get, jump on the VPNs so they can get you know, Netflix without it streaming everywhere. But most Netflix people use VPNs right now just to get different content out of Netflix because you can get, you know, they don't think the cat's out of the bag on this. You can get different content from Netflix depending on where you're streaming from. Like, I've got a VPN in... Uh, ...on which one you're at, you know, I can get different freaking content out of Netflix. Now, just because I'm on Mask Match, I have to get it out from that different thing, but... Back to net neutrality deal, because what everyone wants and they like to believe in this idea of like a free and open internet. Yeah, but that's more. That connects different uh, connects different devices. That's to me that's the internet, and the FCC and the United States federal government will always be in the way of your ability to connect to this fiber optic connection. They. You know, like from just limiting the number of their ISPs, limiting the uh, like, just like the signals that you can even use. The like a lot of people was like uh, when we were talking about radio towers. You know, like a four G uh, LTE connection, right? Everyone sees that as expensive and it's really hard to do. But honestly, the GSM technology is is freaking beautiful. The way that freaking works. And that anyone basically can have their own freaking GSM tower. They will communicate with each other and give us amazing freaking coverage, you know. But you know they don't want to have it. Like GSM towers are not expensive. I made I built one for two grand. Okay, I built one for two grand, sitting in my basement, and it's an amazing piece of tech. What I do love playing with. Uh, I, I don't turn it on much anymore, but you know because I don't really have time to play with it. I do plan on hopefully I make it smaller and less power so I can take it to Port Fest, but you know that's here and there. <laughs> Harry, you're having the time of your life, aren't you? I get to talk radio and dissing the FCC, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, granted, like you know, because like Pi believes he's doing a good job of trying to make the op internet open up. Because granted, those incentives will probably make ISPs dig the last mile and bring things in because if they know they could charge extra for Netflix or whatever content in a certain area. You know, they're pro you know they're more apt to build, or they can get like a different thing to build into a different area that doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, the FCC is also in the way with other regulations because of the simple fact that um, like different areas would have broadband access or just faster internet. Like okay, not WiMAX, but like doing doing um, doing lasers or different like. Uh, 
there's so many different radio technologies to be able to have people to be able to connect to the like the you know the backbone the fiber of the network, but it's too hard to do anything because the regular the phone companies the free U is a utility which you know you can have tons of different DSL companies all connecting to the fiber and allow DSL connections out. But like well, it's DSL. DSL is only slow because AT and T controls it. AT and T is a bunch of dicks. Uh, they could probably everyone could. <laughs> you know, to be honest, in my it, because like well, the way you talk, connects to. So I'm not going uh, connecting to a, a signal office like miles and miles away. It actually is down the street from my house, and that's where the fiber connection's at. I don't even know that where the fiber connection is because if you get on the dark fiber. So there's like weird. If you get on the website, there's a huge map of the country that you can get on, and I recommend doing. The net neutrality. It's it's all about the fight between the FCC and the FTC. Um, you've got uh, well-funded consumer advocates who want to nationalize broadband infrastructure, which. public effort by the FCC to grant itself new relevance and power. Uh, it's a struggle between the agency and the courts uh, over general principles of legal interpretation and regulatory defense, uh, and a convenient rhetorical device in an increasingly partisan argument over the future of democracy, democracy, free speech, and other important principles challenged by disruptive technologies, each of them equally unrelated uh, to network management. Um, okay, so net neutrality is coming up uh, to, uh, it's going to Harry, Harry's in the bathroom right now, so I'm uh, getting messages that things are falling apart in the world and uh, that uh, and uh, net neutrality's up before Thanksgiving and it may get rolled back and everything's uh, falling apart. We're going to be okay, guys. Uh, here, what, when it comes down to net neutrality for me, like I get the argument that the basic principle is we don't want tiered internet, and you don't want to empower the telecoms like Comcast and AT and T and everything to um, start structuring the internet and and picking winners and losers. And it come it, you want, uh, it, for instance, Facebook is kind of doing this right now with. Um, with their out, like they're charging pages a ridiculous amount of money uh, to get seen in people's feeds, and at the same time giving access to people like CNN and New York Times and other outlets, they're giving they're giving them white label access just direct to the algorithm. Yeah, and you get somebody like a Netflix or a New York Times who would get access to uh, the the better tier of the internet. You've got um, you, you, you've got that argument that you don't want these ISPs treating something that everybody relies on um, as you know their personal playground, but at the same time, uh, they're the ones paying all of the cost to lay all of the line to get all of the wire to our houses, and so they are allowed to recoup those costs, and and it. It, it is capitalism, right, Harry? Yeah, correct. Yeah, but it's also a perverted form because laying on that cable, they don't have to. There's radio signals that we can use to get to that, so they don't have to go that far. Like some of these house divisions, they can just run fiber to one point and mm -hmm. then use radio signals from each different house. Like right. you can put in like just four, uh, four GLTE towers, stick it there for the apartment complex, and, uh, and then everything just connects to this thing wirelessly in this one different area to this one freaking tower. Right. But that, but you can't do that, you know. Okay, you can do that, but the regulatory hoops to do different things. One of the main reasons I don't turn my tower on anymore is because I hate going through all the FCC uh, like licensing to turn this thing on for a split second. Mm -hmm. I have to uh, first thing I have got to do is um, I've got to pay the processing fee, the license to get the um, uh, experimental license, mm -hmm. and then so. 
And before I do that, right, I've got to build this thing first because they want to know what signal I'm broadcasting at first. They want to test and then get all that. I have to, so I had to spend all the money to get the tower built first before I even got my license. So I had to get it spent. So, and now I've got to hope they approve my experimental license. And the area that I'm in, I'm only able to turn it on certain times and only for a small window. Yeah. Nuts. Sure. Yeah, well, you, sorry. You, you no, should the F and it's a terrible thing about it because, like, if I set it up correctly, my the, the, that GSM tower is more helping out every other GSM tower around me. I, uh, it's I had to tell it not to let other different phones and things I didn't want to connect to it, so it wouldn't crash my freaking like uh, my, my server that I had running on. Right. But yeah, it. I, I get that, like they're trying to make it through that last mile, but the thing is, the only reason they're doing it is because of how the FCC regulates the yeah, ISPs and all the other things in the area. There are better different companies, things are different tech is coming out, but the, but they've got such a, you know, monopoly control, like monopoly can control on everything, so they control that, like the, the connection to that fiber connection, that, you know, they can basically dictate the rules anyways. And it's, so like, it's, I, I hope out of this that people understand that if they're looking for a savior to the government, it's not going to happen. Net neutrality is the, the tiered government system, it, the tiered internet system, it's going to happen. They will wear you down until mm -hmm. it happens. A1 for everyone fighting the good fight. I would recommend and awesome, fight that fight. But your effort could be used better doing to different technology because Ernest Hancock, another podcast I listen to, and mm -hmm. Declare Your Independence. Um, I'm not going to shout like he does, but uh, if they can, they will, and if they will, they've already have. Right. There's no, you have no proof that they're not doing that currently right now. We've seen some of the stuff through Netflix and some different ISPs doing that. So, it's my thing is like, if they can, they will. You know, Ernest is right with this. So it's more of a get past a different system, support different like technology that gets you past their little system, their little connection system. You know, if you've got a mesh networking set up like in your town, you know, have, hang out with those guys, find out what's going on like that. They get past these different like, you have to work towards these signal. Like, well, that's not proven tech. Yeah, because everyone's so easy going to different things. Right. Uh, so, you know, like find a local mesh network and learn about different networking techniques and to move different things to it. There's so many other different tech that's out there that wants to get past that government system. Right. Because as long as they've got control of it and they're going, if their teeth are in it and they're not going to let go, that's not going to happen. No one's going to go in there, at least in, as I see it in my lifetime, the federal government's not going to let their teeth go of the internet. Sure. So like you've got to learn different things to get past it. And that's just the way, just the way that things are. Now, like I'm not, a, uh, I love streaming tech I love streaming different technology, but you can use different things to like get past there. Like uh, if you have a online public library, like using like RetroShare between different people, you can use that to share and stream different things from other people, and you can use different VPNs to try to hide that, to try to mask that traffic. Now, granted, ISPs can throttle your VPN connection, slow yeah. you down from it from there. Here's here's been my issue with net neutrality all along is that it is the entrance of the government into the pipes of the internet. I mean, it's their entrance into... They're already there. Right, exactly. They're already I there. mean, the 96 telecom laws and, and, mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're already there and if... And who knows how fast interconnection will move from prison like even going through it. Like, because they're, sc they're scanning every traffic piece of traffic and they're copying everything that's coming out the internet anyways. So you're sure. already throttled from that right there. Sure. Just because they're mirroring everything coming out of a port. Yep. Alright, yeah. final thoughts on net neutrality, Harry. Let's keep it to 20 minutes. I'm going to I'm gonna <laughs> keep it really small. I'm going to do the same thing like I said with Ernest Hancock. I said, if they can, they will. And if they will, they think they're probably already doing it. You know? Yeah. It's That's how I feel about it. Like, I will, you know, like, I think the Electronic Freedom Foundation has done a lot of great work. And they've pissed me off sometimes, but they're willing to fight this fight, you know, on awesome but at the same time, it's like, I'd rather work on different technology, different things to get past that system. You know, like looking at things like MadeSafe and trying to get past that type of stuff. It's it's what I would rather put my energy to. You know, right. like learning different different tech, just, you know, bypass the system and then you have the ability to, like, you're still there, we're over here now. We're, you know, we don't need your permission, we're over here. We don't right. need you anymore. You know, you know, like all that money you spent on that, who cares, we're over here. Right. 
All right, thanks for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. We appreciate you uh, being with us so much, uh, especially to our uh, top donors, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, and uh, special thanks to Brantley Spicer. Apparently something's happening in the uh, Dear Leaders Court. There's some drama taking place, and something was said about me, and Brantley was so mad about it that he increased his donation from 25 to $50 a month. So special thanks to Brantley. Uh, very nice of him. So uh, if I seem distracted this last ten minutes, that's what's going on because everybody's texting me and I'm like I'm in the middle of a show. We can do we can deal with this later. Yeah. Uh, so, it, but special thanks to him and everybody who uh, has supported us. You guys are awesome, and uh, we're going to keep cranking out that content. And we hope that you will keep getting involved. So, okay. thank you for joining us. And uh, until we uh, next week, we will not be live because right. it's Halloween. So we may do Monday or Wednesday, or we may or something, yeah. or a recorded show or something. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, we will have two shows next week, come hell or high water. But it is Halloween night, and Harry has a daughter, and so mm -hmm. we want to. Uh, and I've got a movie premiere with our friend Emily Sweet, um, who was uh, co-host on the. Now mothballed Chris Spangle show. The feed's still out there. I'm still putting in uh, content in there, but uh, we're not doing the show at this point. So He'll come back. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, all right. <laughs> i got a lot on my hands right now, but, uh, but teaching people how to podcast in the Chris Spangle show feed at the, at the moment. So check that out. Thanks for joining us, and then we will see you on Thursday.